I'm Peter Maravellis, uh, hoping this finds you all well. On behalf of City Lights Booksellers and Publishers and the City Lights Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to City Lights Live. This is the virtual extension of the City Lights in-store calendar, where we continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums. So as is customary at the outset of each event, I'd like to acknowledge that we are beaming to you from the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ohlone peoples, also known as the San Francisco Bay Area. I'd like to take this moment to offer respect to those who have come before us as stewards of the land. Tonight on City Lights Live, we're delighted to have with us award-winning legal scholar and novelist Ixta Maya Murray celebrating the publication of her new novel titled God Went Like That. It's published by Northwestern University Press and Curbstone Books. Drawing on an actual 2011 Department of Energy dossier, the arc of the story follows the investigations of a federal agent reporting on a real-life nuclear reactor meltdown that occurred on numerous occasions at the Santa Susana Field Laboratory in California's Simi Valley. The lab was dismantled by the government, but not before it created a toxic legacy of nuclear contamination that later linked to numerous cancer clusters in the area. Ixta Murray examines the human cost of governmental wrongdoing and exposes the environmental racism so prevalent in our country. Ixta Maya Murray is a novelist, an art critic, a playwright, a social practice artist, and professor of law at Loyola Law, law School. She is the author of nine books. Her most recent are the story collection, The World Does Not Work That Way, But It Could, out from University of Nevada Press. Also the novel, Art Is Everything from Triquarterly. She has a work in progress, Artivism and the Law, soon to be published by Cornell University Press. Uh, she's received numerous honors for her work, including a White, Whiting Award, as well as grants from art writers, the Barbara Deeming Memorial Foundation, and New York City Arts Corps. She's also been named a fellow at the Huntington Library for her work on radioactive contamination in Simi Valley. Also with us tonight is Jocelyn Sadenberg. She is a writer, educator, and performer based in the Bay Area. Her books include Kith and Kin, Mortal City, Cusp, Dead Letter, amongst others. Her work has been published in several journals and anthologies, such as the SF MoMA Open Space, the Encyclopedia Project, and Bay Poetics. Since 1998, she's worked as the founding editor and publisher for Kripskaya Press, with 39 titles uh, circulating to date. Uh, she's curated literary events throughout the Bay Area, art organizations, and in addition to serving as a longtime director of small press traffic. Uh, she teaches writing, uh, creative writing at the UC Berkeley and also the Prison University Project at San Quentin. I uh, really appreciate her being here tonight. She's been under the weather, and so it means a great deal to us that she made the effort. So very grateful. We're going to be posting links in the chat with which you may purchase book uh, copies of uh, God Went Like That. Uh, so uh, please join us now in offering a warm welcome to Ixta Maya Murray and Jocelyn Sadenberg. Welcome to City Lights. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Jocelyn, thank you so much for uh, being with me tonight. Peter, thank you for hosting. I want to thank City Lights and Elaine uh, for their generosity uh, in uh, bringing me into this space, Jocelyn and myself into this space tonight, and also Carlisle, Stephanie, and Doug. I am uh, so happy uh, to see you uh, here tonight and to have the opportunity to uh, talk with you about some of these issues. So I'm briefly going to talk about uh, Jocelyn and me and why we're together tonight, and then I'm going to segue into um, the disaster in Simi Valley and how uh, it came to uh, my attention and uh, what, what happened there. I'll then do a reading and then Jocelyn will ask me some questions and we'll open up for a Q&A. So Jocelyn is a stunningly talented, um, as Peter was noting, a stunningly talented uh, critic, uh, essayist and poet. And she and I met last summer um, at Fisher's Island uh, at a, a residency where we were um, ensconced together in an old Victorian house that had no sound insulation. And we quickly bonded over the conditions over this residency. Um, we wrote furiously together and had many long chats about the nature of art uh, and politics and how the two things mingled together as well as just discuss the nature and arc of our lives. And so I'm, I'm just so happy uh, to be with her here tonight and, and uh, bask uh, in her generosity and her kindness. Um, so um, 
I first learned in 2019 <laughs> that there had been a disaster um, in Simi Valley, a nuclear reactor disaster to be precise. And I had never heard of this before and I found it shocking. The reason why I discovered it is because uh, in 2018 and early 19, there had been the Woolsey fire, which started in Simi Valley. And this is one of the most destructive and widespread wildfires that had occurred uh, in uh, Southern California. And it uh, ranged all the way, it traveled all the way from Simi Valley to Malibu, uh, uh, destroying um, hundreds of uh, acres and uh, killing several people. I became very concerned with the state of wildfires in California and Southern California where I live. Sorry, I'm moving around because I'm being chased by a spot of light. And uh, when I was researching uh, the nature of the Woolsey fire, why it happened, whether it could happen again, I came across um, a report from a, uh, by, uh, written by an engineer uh, and a nuclear watchdog named Daniel Hirsch. Um, and this uh, was published in, let's see, um, let's see, the, it was published um, uh, in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which I don't know if anyone here has heard of. I had not heard of it. Um, the, Daniel Hirsch is a member of the Bulletin, as well as the Committee to Bridge the Gap. And this is, these are uh, policy organizations that are dedicated uh, to stemming nuclear proliferation and um, uh, and are concerned with maintaining uh, or or trying to create safe conditions of nuclear disposal um, and containment. And uh, Mr. Hirsch wrote that the fire at Woolsey had started within a thousand feet of a nuclear reactor disaster that occurred in 1959. Uh, at the former Santa Susana Field Laboratory. Uh, this was a joint uh, undertaking uh, from two companies, Atomics International and Rocketdyne. Rocketdyne manufactured um, rockets, as its name indicates, and Atomics International manufactured, among other things, nuclear reactors. Uh, Atomics International had been commissioned by the government to embark upon a project called the Sodium Reactor Experiment which was a new type of, so, uh, and it was initiated because under the auspices, under the pressures of the Cold War. Um, it was a new type of nuclear reactor that you used sodium instead of water as a coolant. However, it also used another chemical called tetralin, which I had never heard of um, and still don't know the pre precise nature of it, except I do know that when it's subject to too much heat, it coagulates and can get stuck in whatever type of uh, fitments it, it runs through. And this is what happened with the sodium reactor experiment. Uh, the tetralin coagulated, it created a blob uh, in the sodium reactor experiment in this uh, reactor, and the heat generated by this uh, obstruction wound up uh, damaging the fuel elements in, these, in this nuclear reactor, and fuel elements are the rods in which uh, nuclear, um, uh, uh, fuel is stored. And so that meant that the radioactivity was allowed to emanate from uh, these uh, fuel elements, and they wound up spreading throughout uh, this section of the Santa Susana Field Laboratory. Many people wound up getting cancer and died, although there's not a lot of documentation. Uh, the Department of Energy did do a study and took interviews where there were many anecdotal reports of deaths. Um, but I could not find uh, a hard study uh, collecting the numbers of the dead. Uh, but one of the most pressing concerns is how in order to deal with this radioactive gas that was spreading throughout this facility, someone um, at the SSFL uh, determined to bleed the gas. And that meant that they, they spewed out the gas, they expelled the gas from the facility into the air outside and it wound up wafting into the uh, communities uh, below the hilltop where the SFL, SSFL had been stationed. Um, this bleeding of the gas into the community occurred for several weeks and mostly uh, happened at night and thereafter it was covered up for 20 years. In 1979, Daniel Hirsch, who was the, per per the person whose essay I uh, read and who uh, is uh, pretty much the point man on uh, the SSFL, 
uh, was working at UCLA as a lecturer in engineering. And he and his students and uh, a couple of other people uh, found or were given uh, papers, old papers that had been basically smuggled out from Atomics International. And that's when he learned of the disaster. He gave the papers to a reporter named Warren Olney, who is an avuncular and much beloved uh, local figure here in Southern California, and the story thus broke. Um, community uh, concern, of course, it, uh, exploded, uh, and there has been a considerable local um, activity uh, dedicated uh, to cleaning up um, the Santa Simi Valley and, and Santa Susana. However, um, though tons of uh, rocket fuel, other carcinogens, and these uh, radioactive particles are embedded in the soils uh, of Simi Valley, um, uh, they have never been cleaned up. Um, it hasn't been turned into a Superfund site. In 2007, um, uh, a court order uh, mandated that Boeing, the current owner of the facility, uh, as well as NASA and the Department of Energy, clean up the site. But the state did not enforce the order, uh, which was supposed, there was supposed to be a res residential level cleanup as of 2017 and it, no action has been taken on it uh, so far. So cancer clusters exist and that's where we are in, uh, uh, in the history of this event. So I'm a, I'm a law professor and I'm a novelist. I'm also a person with the, uh, um, whose whole family had cancer. Um, uh, I had cancer, my mother had cancer, my father had cancer, my father died. Uh, uh, the doctors who treated us said that we may have been exposed to something. Of course, we don't know what it was. So um, this personal experience um, uh, alerted me uh, and made me um, kind of, my antenna kind of started to uh, quiver when I learned of these events and I decided to learn as much as I could about them. And I wasn't sure if, what, how I was gonna deal, what kind of written product I was going to create. And I eventually decided <laughs> to write a novel, bless you. I eventually decided to write a novel about it which is very different than a legal brief. And Jocelyn and I can talk about some of those choices and um, how art's ambiguity and um, uh, sort of slant ways uh, approach to problems creates opportunities for revelation and also uh, has its own limitations. So that's the project. And what I'm going to do is read to you for about 20 minutes, uh, from the novel. So the novel takes the shape of an uh, EPA dossier of interviews, as I think Peter was saying. Um, uh, the conceit is that an EPA official has been tasked with taking community interviews, which often happens in the EPA, although not to this degree. Um, they are much more succinct uh, interviews. Uh, and uh, this collection of voices winds up telling the story of Santa Susana and how it affected uh, the people there. So I'm going to begin uh, and tell uh, part of the story of Rudy de Matibag. So here we go. Interview with Rudy de Matibag. December 9, 2019, Mill Valley, California. There is no why, Ms. Rodriguez. There is only how. From the clamor of our births to the silence of our deaths, all events arise through a calamitous process that is known by, by one word, a curious word, a word that signifies um, the lip print on the glass, the mutation of the cell, the dragon's flight, the unexpected touch of the hand, the, the brown bear of strength, and the life blasting enigma of love. That word is accident, Miss Rodriguez. Accident. Our poor planet flies through space on the wings of an accident, Miss Rodriguez. I know this because how else can I explain how my life has unfolded? I am the way that I am because of an invisible wrinkle in my DNA, as well as an intricacy of untraceable errors made by malevolent men working in the secret laboratory, and also for no reason at all. I am here now with all of my varieties of damage, 
because the galaxy is forged in a crucible of error. Human existence is nothing more than an alembic of astonishments and catastrophes. As exhibit one in support of my motion to suppress your misguided framing of my case, which insists that its most pressing question, most pressing issue is why I think that this has happened to me, consider the following. Penny did not like me when we met. Pe Penny, I am speaking of Penny Mayer. I wrote to you about her in my email, Ms. Rodriguez. This was in 1993. Penny and I both worked for Wilmer and Cutler in Simi Valley. I was an appellate attorney and she was a litigation associate in the property law division. Penny protected business owners from the incursion of state and federal regulation in the realm of private property rights, regulatory takings. Whereas I had a much more ecumenical practice, probate, copyright, patent, torts, constitutional law, and administrative law. The first day I laid eyes on Penny, she had just arrived at the office, fresh from Georgetown Law and a clerkship in the Central District. I had been at Wilmer and Cutler for five years in the appellate section, as I have said. I grew up in Simi Valley and attended UC Irvine for my BA and UCLA for my JD. I could have gone to other schools, but I could not. At the same time, I could not leave Simi Valley. Since I was born, I had lived in the same house, my parents' house, the home of Timothy and Jasmine de Matabat, <laughs> a last name that means, interestingly enough, cannot be harmed in our native Tagalog. But from the very start, when I developed pulmonary squamous cell carcinoma at the age of three, and then later when my psych psychiatrist diagnosed me, my family and I realized that I, Rudy de Matabat, could be harmed. Indeed, quite possibly had been harmed, even before the moment of my inception. So I stayed at home with my parents all their lives. They both died of the same disaster that I have survived thus far. My mother in 1991 and my father in 1992. I had been at Wilmer and Cutler for five years when I met Penny. This was in 1993. Um, I, I, I see that I'm repeating myself, a, a tendency that I will try to curb. It was in 1993 and I was alone. I am on the spectrum as we all are. In my weakest moments, I am, I am burdened by a circle of fear. Once I begin to speak with someone, I, I grow afraid that I'll get afraid. And then I am afraid the person I am speaking to will catch my fear as if it were a virus and my mind and my speech will lock into an unbreakable anxiety and my discussant will become so terrified that they run away. My parents did everything that they could to aid me. When I was in fifth grade, they discovered that if I took a book in my hand, my fear would fold its wings or crouch and hide somewhere deep inside me. Do your classwork, my boy, my father said whenever I came home from school crying. Now, now, you'll be fine, my mother crooned, giving me a cup of hot tea or a glass of lemonade. Do your assignment, my love. They told me to read and write, so I would sit at our, sit at our kitchen table and do my homework. And it did soothe me. I felt calmer, better, more in control. That is why I could survive. At Wilmer and Cutler in my office on the top floor where there was the most limited noise, I could absorb a hundred years of precedent in a few hours and thereafter compose a brief on any legal question that will stand against the appellate products of the finest legal minds in the country. I have had the honor of appearing opposite Eric Holder, Neil Katyal, Theodore Olson, uh, not in oral argument, obviously. My arrangement with Wilmer and Cutler was that I never appear before the court personally. I tried to twice and both times I, I suffered greatly afterwards. But my briefs were satisfactory and even with my considerable limitations, I made partner at the age of 22. I made partner the same year that I met Penny. On that day that I first saw her, she stood in the crowded fourth floor conference room. 
Bill Wilmer introduced her to the attorneys and to the staff. It was, it was after 6 p.m. during a cocktail reception. Outside the large window office, windows, uh, night arrived with the harbinger of a dragon-colored sundown. The orange and cerulean shades offset Penny's beauty, which, which shone like a diamond. She was, she was 26 years old. She had auburn hair. Auburn hair is red and brown, both a, a soft and shining shade. Her hair was long and, and wavy then. Her mouth was thin. Her smile was like a tree. A beautiful tall tree branching delicately against the tangerine sky. I stood in the back of the room. My partners liked me to make appearances at events, but we had agreed that I would never have to display myself or speak before a crowd that included people I had not adjusted to. As a general rule at merger announcement celebrations of litigation victories and similar affairs, I would stand near an exit, drinking only plain water and replying minimally to the badinage offered by my colleagues. I knew that my demeanor occasioned some smattering of gossip, most troublingly among the entering classes. Once, when in the bathroom, I heard a young trial associate named James Yearwood called me Edward Scissorhands. At the time, I wasn't familiar with the reference. I now know that Edward, Scissor Edward Scissorhands is a title character in a Tim Burton film played by an actor named Johnny <coughs> and that poor Scissorhands is a traumatized mute with disabilities that turn out to be strengths. For a while, I tried to persuade myself that James' nickname was a charming, charming tribute to my complex character, but I had to admit finally that the sobriquet had not been invented with friendly intentions. But there was Penny. There was Penny with her auburn hair. She stood before the conference room windows, which filled with the bright dusk. She drank a, a glass of champagne while Bill extolled her virtues in a loud voice. Penny Mayer graduated with distinction and as a third year published an award-winning note in the Georgetown Lodge. She clerked for the Honorable Clara Gellhorn in the Central District, which as you all know, is one of the most competitive posts in our region. Help me welcome Penny to our firm. We are so happy to have you. As the crowd clapped, Penny smiled in a shy and modest way, clutching her glass. She stood by James, a tall and thick-haired brute whom I had once seen do 50 push-ups at one of our painful holiday parties. Every time James smiled at her, I noticed she would, she would blush from her hairline all the way down her pale, long throat. I stood at the back by the exit but did not leave, even as the party ratcheted up in volume and vivacity. I stayed because I, I wanted to keep looking at Penny, and I... And though I knew it was impossible, I wanted to make her blush like that too. My resting heart rate rose to an alarming level. Nonetheless, I took a step toward the front of the room where Penny James and Bill stood. I pushed through the assembly of lawyers until I, until I stood in front of Penny. Already some associates and partners had turned to watch my unaccustomed venture into the social wilderness. Penny did not know that I was breaking my own iron rules. She looked at me, beaming. While still holding her champagne glass, I said, greetings. My name is Rudy Demetbag, and I must chime in with Bill to say that we here at Wilmer and Cutler are very happy that you have decided to join our firm. Your file impressed us with your breadth and range of interests, as well as your remarkable letter of, recommenda letter of recommendation from Judge Gelhorn. We welcome you. We, we do welcome you. We welcome you into this beautiful evening with its night sky ablaze with gold in the most tender indigo blue. The world is a place of inscrutabilities that we must succumb to, yet we delight in making new friends with whom we might share the more durable blessings of our endurances, such as the amber of the clouds and the future with its shining silver question marks. The practice of law allows us to interrogate almost everything, including the cost of a human life and the tenacity of the heart's affections. Yet on a night such as this, when your smile like a tree 
grows its soft branches against the purple ink of the air, we are reminded that the poets allege that some gifts allotted to mankind are in secula seculorum, that is lasting forever and ever. And we find ourselves enraptured with the possibility that within this miserable fragment of existence with which we are apportioned grace could ever touch us and let us know that there is a reason, a motive, a, a purpose to being alive. <coughs> Bill, James, and Penny had at this point moved abruptly to the opposite side of the room. There they, be, they began speaking to several litigation associates in the property department. During my soliloquy, Penny's face had grown flat in panic before Bill and James tore her away from me. When she reached the property associate, she brightened up again, laughing and tossing her burgundy locks over her shoulder. For my part, I had grown derailed at the very beginning of my speech when I said, I must chime in with Bill. At that moment, it had seemed I stepped suddenly outside of my body and proceeded to observe myself blathering about the wonders of the world to Penny as if I were watching the third act in Edward Scissor's hands when Edward attempts to socialize with the people in his neighborhood but only gets set upon by a bully. Every word I said to Penny arrived initially like a jewel encased in the luminosity of its own perfection, but then became a swift subject of meticulous and instantaneous second guessing. And I attempted to repair the mounting destruction that I was causing with earnest phrases that when subjected to review were revealed as even more bizarre and inappropriate than predecessors. I was sweating. I looked down. Penny's quarter full champagne coupe stood on a nearby table with its delicate lip print on the rim. I took her glass and fled the conference room. I entered the elevator and hid in my top floor office. I put Penny's coupe on my desk and looked at it. I picked it back up, drank its contents and placed my lips to the print of the rim. After that, I stayed in my office for many hours. I didn't depart until after midnight when I peeked out the window at the parking lot and felt assured that every other employee had left. Penny and I spoke to each other only rarely after that for the next 15 years. She installed herself in the property division and quickly made a name for herself in the area of regulatory takings, exactions in particular. She preferred to do her appeals herself, though at the beginning of her career, Bill asked me to edit her arguments, which were consistently excellent. When I was first tasked with this work, I felt a wild excitement as I felt sure that I could impress Penny with my mastery of federal appellate law, doctrines that I intended to tutor her in during long, productive personal meetings. My aspirations, however, proved disappointed when I discovered that after my tragic first impression at the introductory cocktail, mm -hmm. Bill had identified me as a possible litigation hazard. He explained to me carefully that Penny and I would only communicate through inter-office mail. I attempted to breach this chasm by praising Penny's work product with enthusiastic, smiley face drenched marginalia, but her briefs proved so impeccable that I would have done so anyway, and she graduated quickly from needing my assistance. I thereafter gave up all hope and contented myself with loving her from afar. During this period, I worked between 16 and 17 hours a day, seven days a week. I would wake in the morning and cook myself an enormous breakfast of omelet, French toast, asparagus and season, and black coffee. I ate this meal in the same kitchen where my parents had encouraged me to do my homework during my difficult youth in our house that was seven short miles away from the fetid Santa Susana Field Laboratory. While they lived, our home had been decorated in shades of chocolate and orange and had a battered old sofa that my father had once liked to lounge on half naked while watching baseball on television. Our ancestral seat had seemed to me a paradise of fond feeling and sanctuary, accented as it was by the tuneless ditties that my large laughing mother had sung all day long, the happy chatter of my father, who was a gifted gardener of the Sambaguita, known also by its Latin name of jasmine, Jasminum Sambac, which rose wove its perfume throughout the house like a spell cast by a beneficent fairy. After they died, their horrible, violent, 
and unforgivable deaths. Deaths that I remain sure were spurred by the radionuclide contagion flowing downstream from the lab. I spent two years unable to do anything but work, writing appellate brief upon appellate brief until I developed a dangerous case of pneumonia. That was in 1995, and when my doctor took one look at my haggard face, he submitted me to a brief spate of inpatient care. Afterwards, I concentrated on repairing what remained of my mental health until I felt well enough to refurbish the house and the garden and embark upon my version of living again. And I think I'll stop, I think I'll stop there so that, so that Jocelyn and I can, can share. Ixa, that was so great to hear you. I didn't, when you had mentioned earlier, had I ever seen you do a character, I was like, do a character. I'm not sure what you mean, but now I completely understand Thank what you. this do a character is and you inhabited um, this character so beautifully, this very um, sad Rudy Demetibag. And I just want to, before we get to the questions that I'd already prepared, this this section in particular makes me think of, of like a one of the sort of really important unanswerable questions around the different uh, around the questions of causality yeah. and this this idea that Rudy thinks that everything is just an accident, mm -hmm. but but the book seems to be trying to in some ways um, think about. Uh, this try to come up with a narrative, try and come up with a story of a cause and effect that, that, so that there's some greater understanding and perhaps of, of these tragedies, of these like deaths from, from cancer and um, as if like the narrative could then make it so that certain people could be held accountable and, and, and but yet, yet there's this other side that it's, it's all just accident that you know, some people living side by side were affected and others were not. And I don't know, right. I just wanted you to talk a little bit about this question of, of causality and accident that oh, this section raises. It is, it's such a brilliant question. So one of the central principles in something like tort law, where I can sue a company or a person who uh, I allege has harmed me, um, is whether they have caused my injury. Did they do it to me? And the principles of causation are but for and uh, um, proximate cause, which are two technical terms that basically say, was it foreseeable? But there's also the principle of, of res ipsa loquitur, which means the thing speaks for itself. Right, uh, Jocelyn knows uh, Latin, and so she's able to translate that, I think, That's easier exactly. than I would have been without legal training. The thing speaks for itself. So throughout the novel, so causation is a central principle in law, but it's also an existential question, which is rarely gets any air, it gets, never gets any airtime within the law. Why did this happen to me? Why did this happen? It's particularly compelling and complicated when you're talking about the etiology of a disease like cancer uh, as a result of an exposure that's as diffuse and longstanding as something that happened at Santa Susana. Can it really be proven it can't? You've been exposed to cigarette smoke. You ate hot dogs. You drank Fanta. You had uh, a tweak in your DNA that made you more susceptible. It's unclear. But whether the characters in the book ascribe causation to accidents or, in other cases, ascribe it to divine will, the characters in these book have no problem pointing the finger at Santa Susana, either because of the principle of recipsa loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. We can see it all. It makes logical sense. Or the mystery of God. This is another character who believes in the mystery of God. God's will is a mystery. God controls all. Yet we still have personal responsibility and can be held accountable. So regardless of the explanation of the causation of, the, of, of why this thing happened, these characters blame Santa, the, 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 the directors of Santa Susana and the federal government. So that's, that's why I tangled with that because it, it is such a, and, and, and when bad things happen, you, you, you get on your knees and you say, why? Why did this happen? Yeah, in particular, you're asking, 
often we're asking that question within a kind of rational framework mm -hmm. as if rationally we could like trace the cause mm -hmm. and get to the origin of why these bad things happen right. but often we that kind of is too narrow of a framework to understand or to appreciate why bad things happen it absolutely is too narrow i mean because i mean Tolstoy in War and Peace has this brilliant section where he says things happen for a zillion reasons and also because of God. I mean, the, the concept of causation, if you really actually try to understand why things happen, it blows your mind. It's too complicated. But in the law, if you're unable to prove definitively that this thing caused the other thing, then you're out of luck, then your, your lawsuit loses, which is one of the reasons why the people who worked at the lab were, uh, Congress created a fund for them and waived the causation requirement because reciprocal they were around radiation. Let's, we need to just pay them off. But it only applies to very few people and many people were already dead when the law, when these uh, funds were, the laws enabling the funds were passed. But it's a beautiful question. That's a wonderful question, Jocelyn. Yeah, I'm also kind of stuck on that phrase because the thing can't speak for itself. In fact, that's great. That's great. You know, like we can we can attribute it. Yeah. To something, but it but the thing itself doesn't speak for itself. Anyway, we have I, to wanted, I wanted to ask you about the framing of the whole novel is that there is this one character, Reina Rodriguez, who works for the EPA and who is writing the report. And as both you and Peter mentioned, um, her family was affected by being exposed to radioactive contaminants and other toxins. And yeah. both of her parents or her mother was killed. And she suffered as well. And so she does, she, she like, you know, bookends the book. She mm -hmm. introduces it and then she sort of she introduces that her job to do and how she's going to do it. And then she ends by interviewing herself. Mm -hmm. But in the 10 other interviews, which take up the lion's share of the book, she is not present. Her voice, it's always the voice. The eye is the voice of the person being interviewed, not Rodriguez's voice. But there are these moments where it's so clear that Rodriguez is like, something's happening on the other side of the interview table or yeah. phone line or whatever. And I just, there's this one moment on page, um, where is it? Is it 163? Yeah, I think it's 163, where um, she's clearly, the interviewer is like breaking down Reina Rodriguez and the person being interviewed, who's this really great character, this um, uh, viola singer, the, the actor who sort of traveled the world and done many amazing things is kind yeah. of, turns into a sort of therapist slash mother slash something or other. And um, so I was just thinking if you could read a little bit or how you would read that even, and just to talk about the decisions to have her be so absent from the interviews, but then kind of like, can't really stay out of the picture. Great. Like, as in that instance, when she's like breaking down and crying and viola singer is like, what? it's okay, you can tell me about it, you know. So all right, I'll briefly, I'll briefly uh, read from this section, thank you, Jocelyn, from the section of uh, uh, Viola Singer's story. She's an actor uh, <coughs> who played Gertrude in Hamlet, and uh, she had always struggled with the method, method acting, where you inhabit the emotions and memories of a character, also by connecting with your own emotions and memories, trying to bring um, uh, the force of those memories to bear on your character. And so she's teaching uh, or in tutoring uh, Reina Rodriguez, who is the EPA official, in what, the, what, what you do with the method, how you go through it. And this is where, as Jocelyn says, while uh, Reina is often kind of background you can feel her there are cues given throughout the manus throughout the book about her presence here is where she comes through uh much more clearly so viola says 
what you do is identify the emotional state that your character will embody. And then you remember a time when you had that emotion too. Say, love. Is love an emotion? Uh, in acting it is. In acting, in art, everything is emotion. So let's say you want to remember a time you felt deep, 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 deep love. Perfect love. First, you have to close your eyes. It's called emotional recall. Sense memory. Close your eyes. Come on. There you go. Remember that time you felt that love. Who are you with? You don't need to tell me if you don't want. Where were you? Bedroom. Who were you? A child. Yes. What was it like in there? The color of your room. Hmm, pink, white. What were you wearing? Try, try to remember a striped dress. What was the other person wearing? A long blue dress with feathers, bare feet. Could you smell anything? Ah, Lara Blue, <laughs> so delicate and sweet. Cigarette smoke, white wine. And what did she say? Something about angel singing. And how did you feel? You felt, tell me, tell me. You felt, say it, say it. Oh dear. Oh darling. Oh darling, oh darling. It's all right. It's all right. Go ahead and cry. Oh, we all do. It's perfectly all right. So this is where the character of Raina uh, comes forward much more present and becomes much more present in the narrative. And what Eeks is not reading is that right after that scene yeah. in, in brackets and in, in italics, which usually is something that's not the characters or the person, the eye speaker says, the remainder of this portion of the interview is redacted for space and relevance. So, <laughs> right. so she cuts it off. Raina is redacting herself and her own kind of emotional experience. But we learn that this reference to angels and angels singing is, is comes up in the first section when Raina is talking about her mother. And then at the very end of the novel, it's it's this reference to why the angels sing and and in that story, Satan is kind of like the person who, or the character, the figure who is uh, suffers, is thrown out of heaven, out of paradise, because he tried to let God know that not, not everything was okay in paradise, right. which what, is kind of the character of, of Raina as well, right? and of you as the writer. Yes, yes I am Satan. Yes, <laughs> I was going to get there with you. So um, let's see. You have, let's see, how are we? We're at 6.53. Um, you feeling good for another question? Do we want to take questions from the audience? Maybe from yeah. Stephanie. Stephanie doesn't have to talk if she doesn't want to. I don't see anything in the, in the comments. Do you, do you have any other? Yeah, I have a lot. Um, so. I, yeah, I mean, I would love to hear you talk about why you decided to write it in this form and how, what a particularly amazing form it is because it allows for a collectivity rather than like a singular voice or, or a protagonist told by an omniscient narrator. You have all these first person um, stories that are told, you know, as if they were you know, there's an interview, there's an interlocutor who's silent or who's not present, but it's just, it make it allows for the novel to be filled with all of these 10, oh, 11 different characters and why you decided that this um, project needed that kind of form and collectivity behind it. Well, thank you so much for that question. There were two reasons. One is because it's, it's so hard <laughs> to get your arms around an atrocity or um, a catastrophe. There's so much confusion 
Um, there's so little information, particularly in something like this, where there was a cover up where all the, I can't get a hold of these doc, you know, the documents are unavailable. And uh, to tell a master story about Santa Susana seemed like the wrong choice to me. To impose a matrix on Santa Susana uh, uh, would evade the slipperiness and the the um, absences that take up so much of this story. It's fractured, it's shattered. Um, so I wanted to convey that through these narratives. They're all first person. And that's the reason why I have Raina, we were talking about this before we began. That's why I had Raina as a presence because it's a little, it's, you can run into, you can run afoul of, of um, people's dignities people's histories as a novelist, as a short story writer, if you, uh, I'm not saying it's impossible to tell first person narratives in fiction about people whose experiences you don't, you don't really share. I'm not going to go that far. I think that it is possible, but it is tricky. And it's something that I grappled with. And so I wanted to have the presence of a Latina gaze of, of a, uh, an observer, of a listener to mediate between that character and the audience and the reader to show you this is an unstable space. She is interpreting what is happening. And so I am not, I am not presenting the person as an objective uh, whole. There is some static between the transference of the story and the listener. Uh, some, some things get lost, some things get misinterpreted. They have disagreements among themselves, they have interactions. So, so I wanted to tell the story like this in, in this reason, but I also became interested in the crimes and wounds of empire generally. So what happened at Santa Susana is a crime and a wound of empire. It comes from the heritage of the Cold War and the violence of the United States and its armaments and its building up of a nuclear arsenal and its uh, testing out of nuclear weapons. That is something that we are still living with. Uh, Peter and I were talking uh, even before you arrived about how Hunter's Point, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's something that's happening uh, in the Bay Area. Uh, these stories are, are everywhere. So I thought about the crimes and the wounds of empire, and it's not just relegated to, of course, this story. This story of Santa Susana weaves through many other acts of dominance acts of violence, acts of subjugation. There are stories about the Korean War and massacres uh, that occurred in reality uh, on the part of US, ma US massacres of South Koreans, or North Koreans, of course. Um, there are stories about the patriarchy and women trying to get abortions and flourish, uh, even though they were under the thumb of men. There are, there are stories, as I told with Rudy, he has um, neural diversity, right? He has, um, he's uh, on the spectrum. Um, something my doctor said, you're obviously on the spectrum. So I included that to me. So I included that in the story. And uh, I just thought about neuro neurodiversity and, and the difficulties of, of moving your, your life, uh, moving forward in a, in a world that denies that. So. I wove the tale, I thought about the HIV AIDS crisis and the way that that had been denied uh, by the government and uh, uh, the suppression of truth in that case. And then it led all the way to COVID and uh, all of the misinformation, all of the panic, all of the bad acts uh, and um, the disparate impacts that COVID had on people of color and poor people. So I wanted, I wanted the story not to just, it, it turned into a story not just about Santa Susana, but also about empire and about resilience and coping um, uh, underneath empire. And so that's, that's why I chose the, the, the form that I did. Yeah, it's so capacious. I mean, it allowed you to bring in so many, even though they're like these personal narratives or singular, a singular life, their lives intersect with so many other lives and so many other histories. And um, there's the Rodney King beating. And right, and the Rodney King just... because of Simi Valley, which is, that's what it's yeah. known for. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> How you doing? 
I'm good. All Just right, you wanna you wanna uh, are there? Let's let's. Uh, I think we're. I think this is an hour program. We're at seven o'clock. Are there any uh, questions from the audience that we might be able to take? What do you think, Peter? How you look? How's yeah, it look? Yeah, you know, let's encourage them. I mean, uh, I know it takes a few seconds to kind of like you know put together you know, thoughts about, you know, something that's as complex as this really no amazing, amazing that. book. Uh, you know, what comes to mind for me is, is, is I'm thinking about epistemic injustice and epistemic yeah. uncertainty, which are like two concepts that kind of inform your work. And I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about those terms and how they relate to kind of your larger project, which includes both fiction and nonfiction. So did you read my article on, on Puerto Rico? Yeah. Oh my God, Peter. You were my hero. That you were incredible. You're killing me right now. I can't believe you read my scholarship before uh, this presentation. You're killing me. So epistemic injustice. So thank you. Oh, Peter. So epistemic injustice is um, this theory, uh, philosophy that concerns uh, how we we know the truth we know truths about our lives but certain truths aren't allowed to be broadcast they don't have language they don't have listeners they don't have a platform they don't have an audience so for example in the 1940s or i don't know 1980s 1990s if a man patted a woman on a fanny right at work there was no language for calling that sexual harassment there was no structure for dealing with that problem. That was just the way things were. That was just the way gender was. It wasn't until the women's movement and also a scholar named Catherine McKinnon, a radical feminist, who's one of the pioneers talking about, uh, uh, who described sexual harassment and, and devised laws against it, that we developed a structure for thinking about um, sexual harassment. What happened before there were the words sexual harassment? There was a movement against it. People who experienced sexual harassment were, had more difficulty articulating to themselves what was happening to them because the language had not been developed. And also the entire world was telling them what is happening to you is not a big deal. What is happening to you is normal. And so you resist that and you suffer from it, but at the same time, you have no tools to describe it to understand it and to function within it. This is known as epistemic injustice, ep uh, ep epistemology, which is the science of knowing. And obviously that there is the, that one's form of knowing is treated unjustly. And so Peter, it's such a wonderful thing to bring in with this novel because Right, we're Jocelyn and I were talking about these absences and these gaps when it comes to this absolutely staggering question, why did I get sick? Why did this happen to me? Why did my parents die? Which is what Rudy is dealing with. Uh, he thinks he knows, he's a lawyer, reps ips 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 but, um, and, and, and he is so articulate that he helps create a template maybe for other people. What happened to me was wrong. What happened here was wrong. And so the book simultaneously, so thank you, Peter, the book simultaneously grapples with uh, epistemology and epistemic injustice and tries to create a space to form language and understandings uh, where uh, these things uh, will, we will have more consciousness about them. Of course, I am not the only person doing this. I'm, I'm doing this through art, but uh, Daniel Hirsch uh, and um, there, there are many, uh, um, uh, folks who are activists uh, on the question of uh, Santa Susana, Melissa Bumstead uh, is another uh, well-known activist whose child uh, was diagnosed with leukemia uh, in Simi Valley. And when she was in the children, the pediatric on on oncology ward, she, she met, I think, 20 other patients from her region. And she started to worry this is not normal. What's happening right now is not normal. So, of course, she's creating language. She's creating these structures, and I'm I'm just doing I'm just doing it through short fiction. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. No, that's oh. a, that's a great answer. Thank you. Incredible. And Jocelyn, your 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 study of my book uh, and your your questions are really just so so heartening to me. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much for reading and for writing this amazing book. It's really, it's very, very important work. And thank you. I applaud you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Carlisle, and thank you, uh, Stephanie, uh, for coming, and uh, City Lights for having us, for hosting us tonight. No, such a, such a great pleasure, and congratulations on on this very important new book, and really such an honor to have both of you and Jocelyn, especially under current yeah. circumstances. It means so yeah. much to us that that you made it tonight. So, you know. Hope to maybe host you at some yes, point in not so, too distant. Justin, when is your book coming out? Yeah. I have two books coming out, actually. I have, Let's uh, hear about it. Echo Otherwise is the scholar, is the academic book that's coming yeah. out from Punctum Books in 2024. And then I have a collaboration with a visual artist named Sibel Lyle that's coming out from Kelsey Street Press um, the end of this year. So. Uh -huh. Very cool. Well, you have an open invitation. So if oh, you're thank able, you, Peter. That's so nice you know, of you. It would Very mean a great deal to you. us. So yeah. <laughs> I really want to thank you and the audience for joining yeah. us tonight. Ever grateful. If you're in the hood, come on down, pay us a visit. We are definitely open seven days a week, Monday you. through Thursday, 11 to 8. And then Friday through Sunday, 11 to 9. We're back to pre-pandemic hours almost. Also, I want to point out City Lights is celebrating its 70th anniversary in 2023. We're going to be featuring a whole calendar of events beginning in May and running through to the end of the year. It's going to include both in-store and also online events. We're going to be featuring a poetry readings, historic tours, panel discussions, talks, and much more. So keep an eye on our calendar for that. Tonight's event has been made possible by support from the City Lights Foundation, which is continuing the legacy of our founder, the late Lawrence Ferlinghetti, through public events like this one, our publishing program, and educational outreach all dedicated to sustaining a vibrant community of readers, writers, and independent thinkers. So take care, everyone. We hope to see you all again soon. Be safe. Be well. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Bye. Peter, reading my scholarship. <laughs> what a, man. a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Good night, Bye. everybody. Thank well. you, Stephanie. Thank you kindly, Stephanie. All see right. you soon, all.